Solomon sets up the manpower to build the temple. This is an amazing thing to study. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery, discovering the Bible from Genesis all the way through to Revelation 22. As we discover the Bible, we're going to be looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 2. And this is fascinating. We're going to study that in about three minutes time. So make sure that you get ready. It's going to be a good one. Corey? I'm taking a look at music in the ancient world today. Ryan? Today, I'm attempting to resolve an apparent contradiction within the Bible surrounding the items belonging to the Ark of the Covenant. A yeah, very good one. Uh, music. That's mm -hmm. going to be fascinating. Mm -hmm. Ancient music. Okay. Janice? Today, building up the temple. All right. So take your Bible guide and turn to today's page. Uh, if you don't know how to get a Bible guide, we'll tell you how in just a moment. But let's focus on the Word of God and let's study and hear what God says to us now. Second Chronicles 2 1 through 4 and 11 through 12. Then Solomon determined to build a temple for the name of the Lord and a royal house for himself. Solomon selected 70,000 men to bear burdens, 80,000 to quarry stone in the mountains, and 3,600 to oversee them. Then Solomon sent to Hiram, king of Tyre, saying, as you have dealt with David my father, and sent him cedars to build himself a house to dwell in, so deal with me. Behold, I am building a temple for the name of the Lord my God, to dedicate it to him, to burn before him sweet incense, for the continual showbread, for the burnt offerings morning and evening, on the Sabbaths, on the new moons, and on the set feasts of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. Verse 11. Then Hiram, king of Tyre, answered in writing, which he sent to Solomon. Because the Lord loves his people, he has made you king over them. Hiram also said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who made heaven and earth. For he has given King David a wise son, endowed with prudence and understanding, who will build a temple for the Lord and a royal house for himself. 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 and 11 through 12. You know, over the weekend, it's interesting because we finished out 1 Chronicles and uh, 2 Chronicles we begin today. Uh, it really is something as we focus on this. We look at 2 Chronicles 1 through 5, and today we're focused on chapter 2. This is absolutely amazing. In our reading today, we see Solomon beginning to ready the kingdom of Israel to build the temple. It was a project that was a long time coming. David, knowing that he wasn't the king to build the temple, had instead had many preparations before he passed away. It's true. And he had gathered money resources and friendships for Solomon to utilize. After David's death, Solomon writes to one of the key allies that David had established, the king of Tyre, Hiram. Hiram's response is warm and hospitable. He's not only willing to continue the friendship with Israel led by Solomon, but he's willing to be a supplier for the temple building project. Tyre was one of the greatest cities of this time in history. And later, its relationship with Israel would sour. But for now, it was famous for its resources. And they were utilized to build the fame of God. Now, I imagine the beginning of Solomon's reign would have been a time of great excitement with uh, many possibilities. Possibilities on the horizon of Israel was positioned to become a great nation, serving God. Their future, however, would be determined by their actions. As always, their future is determined by their actions. A lot of people don't understand that, but that's the truth. And we are faced with a lot of potential actions we have presented before us in the West. A lot of things, and in the East, they're also feeling it. 
But nevertheless, let's take our Bible guide and turn to today's passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 2. Now, if you don't have a Bible guide, I want to encourage you to either call us or write for your Bible guide. We'd love to send it to you. And I want to thank you for your donations. They help us send it to you. We appreciate that. But another way you can get this is go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And if you've just watched the program for this first time, it's our website. Click on the Bible Guide and it takes you to a donate page. I want to thank you for your donations. But it takes you to a place where you can download the Bible Guide exactly how we printed it. So that's very, very important. Let's pray today and ask the Lord to teach us his way. Father, we pray and we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. Help us to hear your Holy Spirit. These are your words, and we want to take them in our heart and allow them to change us for who we are. I want to thank you, Lord, in Jesus' wonderful name. And we said together, amen. Let's look at the scripture. 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 1. Then Solomon determined to build the temple for the name of the Lord and a royal house for himself. Solomon selected 70,000 men to bear burdens, 80,000 to quarry stone in the mountains, and 3,600 to oversee them. That's a lot of people. Solomon set up the manpower to build the temple. God uses us to build his kingdom. We are used by God to build the kingdom of God. Now today, it's interesting because in the New Testament, Paul the Apostle from the tribe of Benjamin used to be Saul. Paul the Apostle tells the Gentiles that, no, no, you need to understand that this is the way it is. I mean, this is, this is what's happening and uh, we have to understand that. So isn't that something? Well, this gets even better as we read on. Let's go back to the scripture and listen. It says, then Solomon sent to Hiram, the king of Tyre saying, as you have dealt with David, my father, and sent him cedars to build himself a house to dwell in, so deal with me. Behold, I am building a temple for the name of the Lord, my God, to dedicate it to him, to burn before him sweet incense for the continual showbread, for the burnt offerings morning and evening on the Sabbaths, on the new moons. And on the set feast of the Lord, our God. This is an awesome ordinance. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. Solomon used the friendship David had with Hiram, king of Tyre, to build the temple of the Lord. Now listen to me carefully. The Lord uses all people to build his kingdom, whether they know him or not. (laughs) I remember growing up in the church and... uh, I I would think, well, people who are not Christian couldn't be used by the Lord. But I I need to, I need to, I, I understood later and I need to communicate. What happens is God still accomplishes his will. But if we follow him, give our lives to him and move in his will, that goes a whole lot better for us. But God will do everything that God wants to do. And we need to pay attention to that. And God used everybody to build his temple. That's fascinating. All right, let's go on to verse 11 in this chapter, skipping ahead several verses. Here is what it says. Then Hiram, the king of Tyre, answered in writing, which he sent to Solomon, because the Lord loves his people, he said, he has made you king over them, Solomon. Hiram also said, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who made heaven and earth, For he has given King David a wise son, endowed with prudence and understanding, who will build a temple for the Lord and a royal house for himself. Which brings me to this point. King Hiram responded with favor and blessed the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You see, beloved... We, as Christ followers or Christians, represent the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Isn't that great? That's wonderful. 
But we, we need to do this rightly. We need to say, God, I, I need to come to you and I'm, I, I need to repent and help me today to make the right decisions because as I make the right decisions, then you will get glory and your kingdom will be built. And so that's what we need to consider today. That's how we need to pray. That's how we need to focus our attention. That's very, very important. So Father, today, as we come to you and listen to this scripture and understand what you've said, we pray in Jesus' name that we would do so according to your will. Help us to follow you. And we thank you, Lord, for that. In the name of Jesus Christ, and we all said together, amen. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ today that we would not be sidetracked by our own ideas, but we would be directed by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come into our hearts, come into our life today and teach us your way and show us your path as we look at Zechariah and learn about the future. Help us to hear what you're saying in the name of Jesus Christ. And we said together, amen and amen. So we get a lot of detail here about Solomon in the beginning of his reign and how he's attempting to honor God at the beginning of his reign, which is really good. He starts out really well. Uh, and, you know, this is how several of the kings of Judah start out that maybe they don't finish quite so well, which is an understatement in the case of Solomon. But we see him worshiping here at Gibeon because we're told that at when Solomon takes the throne, uh, the tent tabernacle and the bronze altar, the original bronze altar of sacrifice is set up in Gibeon. So this is where Solomon goes to worship. And music, as we know, was a huge part of worship at the tent tabernacle, at the tent where the ark was kept, and later at Solomon's temple. So let's take a look at music, but not just music in the Bible, music in human history in general. Take a look. As far back as historians can see, music has been a part of human life. From the rock gongs of prehistory to the intricate bull lyres of Ur, mankind is musical. The Bible's first mention of music comes from Genesis chapter 4, an origin story. Jubal, whose name itself means ram's horn or trumpet, is given credit for inventing the harp and flute or lyre and pipe, perhaps the double flute that shows up in many ancient depictions alongside the lyre. Knowledge of ancient musical instruments has come down to us through physical remains, artistic depictions, and literary evidence. These sources have verified that instruments were made from diverse materials, some of which are easily preserved, while others tend to rot with time and regular wear. In the percussion realm, drums made of stretched hide and tambourines are known to have been used, but decay quite easily. So far, none have been found from ancient Israel. Rattles, cymbals, and bells are a different story. Many have been found. Before the invention of bells as we know them, pottery rattles or shakers were popular. Metal sistrums, bronze cymbals, and noisy jewelry round out this category. In the woodwind camp, there is the now famous Second Temple period bone flute that was discovered in the City of David excavations. Many types of flutes existed in the ancient Middle East, but they weren't the only instrument that utilized a type of bone. Animal horns were used to create trumpets or shofars. Trumpets could also be made out of metal. We know from the Book of Numbers that silver trumpets were made for ceremonies of Israel. Interestingly, metal trumpets may have had an association with the lotus flower, whose shape certainly is trumpet-like. An example of this association was discovered in King Tut's tomb. His silver trumpet and its wooden insert are decorated with the lotus. In the Book of Psalms, there are several sections that are to be played according to the lilies, or according to the lotus. This may mean that they were songs played with trumpets. Listed in David's worship roster for the temple were stringed harps and lyres. These lyres came in many forms and sizes from ones that sat on the floor to handheld. From modern reconstructions, it's known that larger lyres played in lower registers than the smaller handheld styles. In Psalms, there are several references to the gates of Jerusalem and worshiping in the gate structure of the city. This seems to have been a regular place to play music, sing, and dance, as evidenced by the Bible and by carvings of musicians that adorned the gates of a few discovered Hittite cities. 
All of these instrumental remains, from physical to literary, have captured the imaginations of researchers for decades. For some of the more musically inclined, ancient Mesopotamian pieces of music have been somewhat deciphered, revealing complex cording that records both melody and harmony. Tempo, ornamentation, and vocal accompaniment still remain a mystery. There is a ton more that could be said about the history of music when it comes to human history. There's so much more that could be said, uh, even biblical history of music. But this is a good starting point, I think, just to trace some of the ancestry, some of the antiquity of music and some musical instruments. You know, it's interesting because when you study the history of music and the, the tunes and all of that, uh, we, we had instruments we don't have anymore, but we have instruments now we never had before. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting. And I, I listen to some people who say, well, they, they don't sing new music like we used to sing it in the ancient days. And I said, OK, well, when was that? And they're talking about the time when they grew up, which was the 1950s. <laughs> Apparently, that was the ancient days. <laughs> so uh, it's interesting. We need to pay attention to what the words of the music are because the words are really important. Psalms is 150 chapters of music. And we need to pay attention to that. Very good, Corey. Thank you, Brian. All right, well, in First Chronicles chapter five, we read about how the Ark of the Covenant was brought into God's new temple, which Solomon built. And I wanna talk about the Ark today because skeptics have claimed that the Bible is an error regarding it, and more specifically, an error about the items that belonged with the Ark. These items included the golden censer of manna, the budding rod of Aaron, and the stone tablets that had the Ten Commandments on them. And the question is specifically surrounding the presence of these items, as well as their location. Take a look. Does the Bible contain errors and contradictions? Sometimes, without careful consideration of the scriptures, it can appear so. For example, it seems that there is a discrepancy regarding the items contained within the Ark of the Covenant. That's because while 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 9 and 2 Chronicles chapter 5 verse 10 clearly state that only the stone tablets containing the Ten Commandments were inside the Ark, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 4 says that the Ark contained not only the stone tablets, but also the golden censer of manna and the budding rod of Aaron. However, in reality, there is no contradiction here because these passages are referring to two totally different times in Israel's history. Hebrews is referring to an earlier era in Israel's history during the time of Moses, when the Ark included the tablets, the censer of manna, and Aaron's rod. But 1 Kings chapter 8 and 2 Chronicles chapter 5 are referring to a point in history much later on, the time of Solomon's temple. And obviously by this time, the manna and rod had since been removed. Another apparent discrepancy has to do with the placement of the manna and rod. For example, Exodus chapter 16 verses 23 through 34 and Numbers chapter 17 verses 10 through 11 seem to indicate that these items were placed before the Ark of the Covenant, but Hebrews chapter 9 verse 4 says that they were within it. One solution to this is found in the original Hebrew text of these Torah passages, which can be translated to indicate that the objects had been placed inside the Ark, not before it. Thus, all these passages would be in harmony. But even if the Hebrew text didn't allow for such a translation, there still would be no contradiction. This is because Hebrews 9 never claims that the manna and rod were inside the ark all the time. Nor does Exodus 16 nor number 17 claim that the manna and rod were before the ark all the time. It's very conceivable and even probable that sometimes these items were placed before the ark and at other times, perhaps during their travelings through the wilderness, these items were stored within the ark. Hence, there is no reason to doubt the accuracy of the biblical text. So when we study the relevant passages, it's very easy to see that they are all referring to different times and places in history, and therefore do not contradict each other. As we all know, things change over time. It's like the dietary laws in the Bible. They also changed over time. When God first created the world as a perfect paradise, humans and animals were all vegetarian. But after the flood, God gave man permission to eat all things. And then later, God put dietary restrictions on Israel. But since Christ came, these restrictions have been lifted. And in the new creation, we'll all be vegetarians once again. 
So there's no contradiction here. Yeah, it's really important to remember that, that uh, things will be different how we eat. Things will be in, in when we're with God. Um, and, and it's just absolutely fascinating. I just want to make a quick mention here that mm. I put together six sermons from Zechariah, and uh, they're only presented on this video. I didn't really, I did one sermon, but I really didn't do any of the other sermons anywhere else. And these six sermons are now available. Go to our website at Bible Discovery TV. I did them specifically for this. So if you're interested in that series, go to our website and uh, you can learn how to get that in DVD or as a download. All right. And if people don't use the internet that way, they can also call the American office. They can. The they call the U.S. or the Canadian office and get it that way. So very good. All right. So Janice. All right. Well, Corey was talking about music. You mentioned music. I wasn't going to sing that song, Building Up the Temple, but you kids remember <laughs> when we would do Building Up the Temple, Building mm-hmm. Up the Temple. Building up the temple of the Lord. Say, brother, won't you help me? Sister, won't you help me? Building up the temple of the Lord. I loved singing that song. And the kids loved singing that song because they could turn and point to one another to build up the temple. And and you just, let me say uh that you lead music on Monday night for Awana. For Awana. It's so much fun. (laughs) Kids are so much fun. because I've never really grown up. That's the trouble. So we just have a lot of fun together. But we see in this chapter of of, uh, 2 Chronicles, chapter 2 is what we're focusing on, that Solomon is preparing to build the temple. And I'm telling you, Solomon selected 70,000 men to bear burdens, 80,000 to quarry stone in the mountains, and 3,600 to oversee them. This is a a massive amount of people to prepare to build the temple. And, 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 you know, we need that fellowship on this side of the cross as we build God's kingdom together, as we live as the salt and light of this earth, to be able to strengthen ourselves through the word of the Lord so that we can live um, appropriately in this world. And uh, we need to be encouragers of each other to help in the building of God's kingdom, not our own, but in building God's kingdom. Now, earlier in the scripture, in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, we see how Solomon's father, David, who really came up with the idea to build a house for God, God told him, it won't be you, David that builds the house, it will be your son Solomon. But we see then how David just didn't drop the idea and say, okay, well then I'll leave it up to Solomon. David began big preparations and gave offerings of supplies that would be needed to build that temple. And that made me stop and think that as parents and as grandparents, we need to Put those preparations into our children and into our grandchildren. What do I mean by that? I mean that we need Rod as parents, Ryan and Corey and Brandon. We had three children and now we have wonderful grandchildren, Oliver and Elias and Emerson and Matthias and Wesley and Tessa. And now we can begin to pour into our grandchildren as we did our children, the word of God and to live before them, showing them how that we need to follow Christ. We need to get his word into our lives and to live that as an example in preparation. Because on this side of the cross, we don't have a physical temple structure. We believe that that begins in our hearts, that we become the temple of God. And so we need to be living right. We need to be uh, not just preachers of the word, but we need to be living. It's easy to say something. It's another thing to be able to live that and mean it. So I just thought about that scripture today in how that Solomon gathered uh, great armies, vast amount of men to begin the physical building of the structure. And yet David, his father, gave him all the prepara- all of the things, the material things that he would need. And how that just really translates to this side into our modern day where we need to be encouragers of one another. We need to be able to work together. You know, these teams of thousands of men coming together had to work together in order to build that temple the same way as us. We can't just be divided. We need to be unified in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then as people... As parents, as grandparents, we need to prepare and teach 
these, the generations and the children growing up, how to be that. And in order to teach that, we have to teach that well. We have to live it. We have to know it. We have to know it. it. We have to live it. Uh, And I never thought being a parent, I realized I, because what I did affected my children. I never thought being a grandparent affected my children. It affects my children and my grandchildren. Yes. So how I live is still being watched. How you live is still being watched. And so I think, oh, Jesus, help me today. Help me to live right today. So my prayers have intensified and and we seek God more and ask him to give us his will, give us his way as we focus on his word and take it in our lives and begin to live it. That's what we need to do. That's how we show God's example, a living example. I have recently put together a six series of sermons that nobody has heard except you, if you order them. And I want to remind you that these sermons are from the chapter in Zechariah, and this is very important. Zechariah is a great passage of scripture. Uh, he, He is one of the most messianic in the Old Testament. It is absolutely stunning. So my suggestion to you would be go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and check out there. You're looking for the sermon series that Rod Hembry's done, or you can call us or write to us. And as we respond to you, you will get a hold of these. Today, let's pray. Lord, I praise your name above all else. There's a lot of things that are going wrong, but there's a whole lot going right. And what's going right is with you. So I come to you to praise your name. 